I came into church one Sabbath morning. I was all excited about the sermon that I was going to preach, and as I walked into the foyer of the church, this was in Florida, so it wasn't here, but as I walked into the foyer of the church, all of a sudden, a couple of ladies came running up to me, and they said, Pastor, Pastor, the women's bathroom, one of the toilets is plugged up, and we need you to go in there and unstop it for us. I looked at him, and I said, you want me to do what in my mind? But like a good pastor, I said, oh, let me take care of that for you. And I went on in to the bathroom, and I unplugged the toilet. But the question that I want you to think about this morning is when you are asked to do something that maybe you think is not your job, or maybe you think is beneath you, or maybe you think you shouldn't even be involved, what kind of a response do you have? Is your response, you want me to do what? Or do you actually think about that maybe you could be a servant for someone else? I'd like to ask you to bow your heads as we begin this morning. Our loving Father in heaven, today as we consider the term servanthood and what it means to us. May we recognize that Jesus set the example for us and that if we long to be great in the kingdom of heaven that we will learn what it means to serve others, to truly have the heart and the mind of Jesus. And I pray that right now, even as we pray, that your Holy Spirit will begin moving on our hearts. Because we know that in order for Jesus to return, there has to be someone who fully reflects his character. So I pray that you would speak to us today through your word and by the power of your spirit. May our hearts be open and receptive. May we be focused and listening to what it is that you would say to us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Our topic this morning, you want me to do what, is simply about service, having a servant's heart. As we will see that serving is what really brings glory and honor to Christ. I want to begin our little journey by going in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 5, to a verse that you're very familiar with, Matthew chapter 5, and in fact this morning in part of our Sabbath school class, Uh, It was brought out the fact that one day God will have a people that will fully reflect His character because they will reflect the glory of God to the world. So when we look at Matthew chapter 5 and we begin in verse 14, Jesus is speaking, He said, Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light to all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. When we serve someone, when we do good works, it's not so that we gain glory. It's not so that people look at us and say, oh, what a great guy or girl they are. It's so that they look at us and see what Jesus is really like. In a publication, Manuscript Release, Volume 7, page 47, there's an interesting statement that says, True service involves a faithful discharge of the daily duties. Even as you engage in your daily task, you may reflect the divine image. Those who will faithfully cultivate a spirit of self-denial and self-sacrifice, learning from the Savior the lessons of meekness and lowliness of heart, will be in a position where God can use them in His work of reflecting to the world the glory of the divine image. So, what is servanthood? That's a question that we all need to answer because today the concept of servanthood has largely been abandoned in our culture. 
In fact, in his book, The Jesus Style, Gail D. Irwin describes servanthood in this way. A servant's job is to do all he can to make life better for others, to free them to be everything they can be. A servant's first interest is not in himself, but others. Servanthood is a loving choice we make to minister to others. Now, I held off thanking Greta for that beautiful song for a very important reason, because Greta is a beautiful example of servanthood. You see, when Joni and I, about, uh, I guess it was a week and a half or so ago, Joni saw on the Brevard Facebook page that a young lady at the Brevard School of Music was asking if there would be anyone that would possibly be able to bring her to church on Sabbath. Well, Joni responded to that message and said that we would be happy to bring her to church. And then as they communicated back and forth a little bit more, we found out what her gifts and music were. Then obviously at Brevard, we decided, you know, it would really be nice to have this girl do special music for us. And so we asked her if she would be willing to be part of the service. And here she was traveling a long way in the middle of all of that music and doing all of that work, and she said, I'll be glad to play for your church. So then we thought, well, we'd like to have her at Mills River. And so we asked a couple of people, and she was willing to play for us today. When you're asked to do something, are you willing? Are you willing to do whatever the cause may be or may need? Having a servant heart often goes against everything that we are taught in this world today because our society is all about me, number one. Make sure I'm taking care of myself first. And that's why it's a heart battle. Know it or not, we are all serving someone. The question is, who am I serving in my life? Go with me to Romans chapter 6. And we'll look at verses 16 through 18 just for a moment. Romans chapter 6, verses 16 through 18, because there's a key to servanthood that we need to know. To be a true servant, we need to understand what it really entails. Romans chapter 6 and beginning in verse 16, Paul says, Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered to you. Being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. When I have become the servant of righteousness, that word righteousness simply means right doing or right with God. When I become a servant of righteousness, my heart is in tune with God and with His will and with His nature and with His character. I like that phrase because I often hear people say, is it better to be right or to be righteous? You see, when we really understand what true servanthood is all about, we don't have this burden that we've always got to impress our thought or our way into a situation. We understand that God is in control, and we allow Him to make the impressions. You see, you need to answer a very important question this morning. Now listen carefully. Are you more interested in being served or being a servant? There was a first grade teacher that asked her students one time, what do you do to help around the house? And these were some of the answers that she got. One little girl said, I dry the dishes. And one of the boys said, I sweep the floor. Another one said, I feed and water the dog. Every student in the class went around and told something they do to help out at home, except for one little boy that sat in the very back. And the teacher looked at him, she said, what do you do to help out at home? He said, I stay out of the way. (laughs) Now, you know, we chuckle at that statement, but you know what? It seems that that's a problem in the church at large. A Gallup poll discovered that only 10% 
of church members are active in any kind of personal ministry in their churches. 50% said they have no desire or interest in serving in any ministry. Now, I hope that what that will do this morning is make you consider the fact that if only 10% of the people are doing all the serving, there's an awful heavy load on those people. And if we really want to be followers of Christ, if for no other reason, we should take on the role of serving so that we lighten the load of someone else. In Luke chapter 19 and verse 10, the Bible tells us that the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. Jesus came with a mission. He had one purpose, one goal, one focus, and that goal was to save the lost, to redeem His children and to bring them back. If we say that we are followers of Christ... Do we really have that same love for the lost? Do we really want to see someone else find Jesus enough that we would give ourselves, give of our time, our resources, our energy? To serve takes sacrifice, and maybe that's why true servants are hard to find. There was a church, interestingly enough, that had just had a nominating committee get together, and they were electing officers, and they came upon the need of a leader in the young junior boys, junior high boys class. And as they started putting out little filters and trying to find who would be willing to to serve in that class, they came down to the list, and lo and behold, on that list for that class to lead out, there was only one name. It was a young man in his early 20s. But when the pastor saw the young man's name and what they were asking him to do, he said, you must be kidding. You really think he's going to be able to lead that class? But there were no other names. And he had offered to serve in that position. So they went ahead and let the young man take the class. And strangely enough, the class began to do amazing things. It began to grow and the young people's spiritual lives began to grow. The pastor was so impressed with the young man's work that he invited him to his house for lunch. And he said, maybe you can share with me what it is that you do that makes this class so successful. The young man pulled out a little black book that he had. And on each page, he had a picture of one of the boys. And under their name were comments like this. Having trouble in math. Comes to church alone. Would like to be a missionary someday. And then the unlikely candidate said to the minister, You see, I pray over those pages all week long. And then I'm so excited to come to church to see what God has done in those boys' lives. Now, my question would be, how many of us would be willing to do that? How many of us would be willing to not only accept the position, but to follow through to the point that we're making a difference in someone else's life? Jesus' life was all about ministry. It was about serving. He spent much of his ministry teaching the principle of unselfish service and self-sacrificing love. Turn with me in your Bibles to our verse for today, but we're going to start a little bit earlier. Matthew chapter 20, and we're going to kind of look at the overall situation, which will begin in Matthew 20 and verse 20. And I'd like for you to consider with me this morning what really took place in this conversation with Jesus and the disciples. While you are going there, I want to remind you that in chapter 19, Jesus had the encounter with the rich young ruler, where in that instance, he was teaching that young man that it was more about giving rather than getting. It was about giving to others and helping others along the pathway of life rather than building up all that you can for yourself. And then in chapter 20, he told the story about the 11th hour worker. 
Again, he was helping people realize, don't be worried about what it is you get for what you do and what someone else may get. Just remember that service is about serving. And be thankful when those 11th hour workers come in that someone else has seen the light and wants to serve along with you as well. Here in chapter 20 and verse 20, the conversation begins. Then came to him the mother of Zebedee's children with her sons, worshiping him and desiring a certain thing of him. And he said unto her, What wilt thou? And she saith unto him, Grant that these my two sons may sit, the one on thy right hand and the other on thy left hand. But Jesus answered and said to her, Ye know not what ye ask. Are ye able to drink the cup that I shall drink of, and to be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They say unto him, We are able. And he saith unto them, Ye shall drink indeed of my cup, and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. But to sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give. But it shall be given to them for whom it is prepared of my father. <clears throat> Excuse me. Verse 24 And when the ten heard it, they were moved with indignation against the two brethren. Now I want to pause right there. And I want you to remember just for a minute that when Jesus chose the twelve disciples, he didn't run down to the local university of the Pharisees and the scribes and, and pick some students that had been going through all the classes. He picked these men, as some would say, or misfits, from every walk of life. Now listen to me carefully. And yes, a couple of them had bad tempers. One of them was boastful and loud. One of them was a doubter. They were all worried about who would be considered the best, the greatest. They bickered. They had envy and jealousy. They were filled with pride at times, and their feelings were easily wounded. It was quite a group. But really, this morning, are we much different than they? Are our feelings sometimes easily wounded? Do we sometimes get prideful as we interact with others? You see, we're not really much different than they. Most of the time, we're willing to help as long as it's not an inconvenience. As long as it works with my schedule, the good news about the disciples and for you and me is that the more they were with Jesus, and as time progressed, they were transferred, transformed, excuse me, into holy men of God. They were servants for their Lord, and we too can be like them and be like Jesus as well. So back to our story. James and John and their mother come to Jesus. Now, I don't want to be too hard on their mother because I know what moms are like. Moms like to see their kids be successful. They like to see their kids do well, and they like to see people notice their children. I remember one time I was doing some music for an evangelist. I won't say what his name is, but we had become somewhat friends, and we actually were doing a series of meetings in Chattanooga. And uh, as we were there, my mother lived in Chattanooga. And so she lived in some uh, condominiums where they had a uh, racquetball court. And this evangelist asked me, he said, hey, do you know anywhere we could play some racquetball? And I said, well, my mom's got a place we could play free there. So we met that day, and he took me up to the court, and we played racquetball. And when we got back, my mom came out to the car, and he was dropping me off. And my mom's first words to this man were, why don't you ask my son Ralph to sing at more of your meetings? See, moms can be that way, can't they? But you know, Jesus wasn't offended. Jesus understood, but Jesus knew that they really didn't know what they were asking. But you know, what's interesting is that verse 24. When the ten heard it, they were moved with indignation against the two brethren. Do you get jealous, envious when... Somebody else is seeking for a position that maybe you think you should have? Now what's really interesting is how Jesus kind of gently let them know what it's all really about. In verse 25, it says, Jesus called them unto him. 
He said, you know that the princes of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them, and they that are great exercise authority upon them. But it shall not be so among you. Whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. The Greek there is servant or attendant. And whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. The Greek there is slave or bondman. Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. Mm. Jesus reminded them that the way of the world is dominance over other people. The way of the world is putting yourself first, making sure you're taken care of, and then if there's any time or room, you will worry about others. But he revealed in these last few verses, he revealed what true leaders are all about. What it really means to be like Jesus, it's not in gaining, it's in giving. It's not in glory of my own, but it's in God's glory. To be like Jesus is to serve, not for notice, not for honor of men, not for praise, but to let others see what Jesus is really like. Many of you are probably familiar with the great evangelist D.L. Moody. He would carry on and have Northfield Bible conferences in Massachusetts in the late 1800s. And at one of those conferences, there were a lot of Europeans that came to the conference. They were all staying in the dormitories, in the rooms. The Europeans were accustomed to a, a different type of thing, that when they would go to places like that, every night when they would go to bed, they would set their shoes outside their door, and during the night, the hall servant would come and clean and polish their shoes. Well, this was America, and D.L. Moody knew that there were no hall servants, and he knew that this could be an embarrassing moment for these young men. So he thought that he would see if he could find some willing servants. He went around and asked some of the students that were there, and they either said, mm, we can't do that, or they came up with some pious reason why they weren't able to. So D.L. Moody, Moody, the famous evangelist, went around all of the halls that night, gathered up the shoes, took them into his room, cleaned and polished every one. No one would ever know this story ever happened, except for while he was in the middle of cleaning the shoes, a close friend came by his room. He stepped inside and saw what was taking place. And he made sure that from that night on that there were other people that were helping out cleaning and polishing those shoes. They went through that whole entire conference, and those Europeans never knew the difference. They did not know that it was other men there that were doing the job for them because D.L. Moody had a servant's heart. How about you today? Do you have a servant's heart? Are you really willing to serve with self-sacrificing love? Are you willing to serve even at times when it may not be your comfort zone? It may not be the thing that you like, but you realize that God's work needs your help? Today, the one thing that impressed me in our Sabbath school class was not so much about all of the things that we talked about in Jesus coming. It was the point that when Jesus comes, that there will be a group of people that fully reflect who he is. And if we say that we want to fully reflect who Jesus is, would we not then in turn want to act as Jesus did? Would we in turn not want to learn to serve others with a willing heart? Would we not begin to realize that when we are serving is when our hearts are filled with the most joy? When we do something for someone else? Look in your own experience and think about the times that you have gone out of your way to do something for someone else. And the joy that filled your heart. And you know, actually, we were talking about this in our uh, Creation Health Seminar. Do you know there is something that they call a helper's high? 
that people who help other people, they get like this high, and they find out that when people help others, they not only get the high at that point, but when they look back on the time that they helped someone, that feeling comes back again. I believe that Jesus gave us the helper's high. I believe he gave us that so we could realize that true joy, true happiness, true contentment is when I am not thinking about me, I'm thinking about someone else. Another thing I want you to consider as we bring this to a close today is when you help someone else, suddenly your burdens are lighter. You're not so worried about yourself and all the things you're struggling with because God has led you into the circumstance or the life of someone else who has got just a little bit more troubles than you and you're able to bring some joy and light into their life. We're beginning a new year. We have new officers and and, uh, Joseph sent uh, a nice article thanking those who have served us over the last two years and and being thankful for those who have chosen to serve the two years coming up. But my prayer is, is that we will have such a transformation in our ideal of service that this church will never look the same again. That when people come in the doors of this church, they won't just see friendly people, but they'll see people that are interested in their life. And that we will look around the room at those that we worship with and understand that everybody is going through trials. I want you, I'm going to do a mini commercial for my sermon on the 14th, holding on through the hard times. We are going through some of the hardest times in earth's history. And I believe that we need to understand and know that God is still in control. God is still standing beside us. And no matter what goes on in this life around us, we can know that there is still a God that loves us and longs to lead us to the kingdom. And we cannot give up now. The devil knows that he has but a short time. And if you've looked around you, and if I were to start laying out all the things just in Joni and Mai's experience... The devil is pulling out all the stops. But you know we can combat that. We talked about it in Sabbath school class this morning. Do you know that Jesus' kingdom is the only kingdom that was not won by power, it was won by love. His kingdom is a kingdom that will be won by love. Jesus' kingdom is the only kingdom that wasn't won by killing other people and conquering other people. His kingdom was won by dying himself. No other kingdom did that. Do you have a servant's heart? If you have a servant's heart, then you have the heart of Jesus. I don't know about you this morning, but I want to be like Jesus. I want to invite Greta to come up, and we're going to share a song with you as we close. And I hope that as you listen to the words, that your heart will just be stirred inside to want to be like Jesus so that you can reflect him to the world around you. Father, what to say? Teach me, Father, how to pray. Teach me all along the way how to be like Jesus. Teach me how we may be one Like the Father and the Son And when all is overcome I will be like Jesus Jesus 
Lord, make me like you. Please make me like you. You are a servant. Make me one too. Oh Lord, I am willing to what you must do to make me like you, Lord. Make me like you. And I would be like Jesus. Sing with me. I would be like Jesus. Help me, Lord, to grow. Help me, Lord, to daily grow more and more like Jesus. Let's bow our heads together. Our loving Father in heaven, sometimes, Lord, we get overwhelmed with the cares of this life but Lord may we recognize today that you've given us a remedy for that by teaching us to serve others as we learn to serve as you did we realize that the cares of this life don't seem so heavy we realize that our thoughts and our mind are taken off of ourselves and placed upon others or your work or what we can do to serve you Lord, help us to understand that this is the remedy for so many things that we struggle with in life. If we will only seek to serve as Jesus did. I pray today that your spirit will move upon every one of our hearts. You know the areas we are weak in. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to understand that when we learn to serve as Jesus did, we will touch so many hearts and lives. And we will truly reflect the divine image. And when we get to that place, you have promised that you will be able to return. Oh, help us to understand today that we can hasten your coming by seeking to follow in your footsteps. Bless us today. Be with us as we go from this place. And may our hearts be filled with the desire for service and love. Thank you for hearing and answering, because we ask it all in Jesus' name, amen.